Thank you for that introduction. Uh, and thank you all for being here today. Um, yeah, I'm Anusha. Uh, I'm here with my colleagues, Vincha and Zone Patrick. We are data scientists at Tesco. And today we are here to talk to you about training object detection models with small data sets. So the primary motivator for this session here today is that data, so annotated data that you need, is very expensive, uh, and even more so in the context of object detection. So here we are to share some ideas, some techniques that will hopefully come in handy when we're trying to solve this challenge. Yeah, so first a little bit about, sorry, let me just, yeah, a little bit about Tesco. I'm sure a lot of you have heard of us. Um, we are a retailer uh, in the United Kingdom and Central Europe. And we are the largest supermarket in the United Kingdom. We have over 3,500 stores and over 300,000 employees. And what this means for us as a data science team is that there's large volumes of a variety of data that we have access to, and we're trying to use that to help the business. So uh, at Tesco, the data science team is quite big and we're well established. So we have a diverse portfolio, um, and we have a lot of data scientists across multiple locations working together. And yeah, these are just some of the domains that we assist the business in. OK, so the tutorial today will be structured as follows. Um, so first, I will begin by taking you through the basics of object detection. Um, then Vincenzo will come on and he'll share some thoughts around how to select the best data set for the task. And then Patrick will come on and help us understand how do we actually get our models to learn from the data that we have. Right. So to start off with, um, yeah, so in the image that you see, um, say you just want to identify the presence of a dog. What is the probability that there is a dog in the image? So that is a classification or a recognition task, and it is relatively simple. But what if you want to know where exactly in the image the dog is? So that is what we call the detection task. So it's a combination of localization and classification. But wait, there's more dogs, and unfortunately, the universe is vast, and there's more than just dogs. So there's lots of different kinds of objects and multiple instances of that, and this becomes a challenging task. So what this boils down to is three questions. So is there an object? Uh, where is the object? And what is the object? Now, for the human visual system, this is a trivial task. Like, we can look at images and identify it uh, without any hassle. So for computers, it's not so instinctive, and that is the challenge that we're trying to tackle here. So um, when you talk about um, working with images, it's more helpful to think of representations of images that encode some of the details in it rather than the raw pixel values. And the way that you go from these raw pixel values to those representations, uh, earlier that used to be through some handcrafted features say um, edges uh, or corners, gradients in the image, and then some classical machine learning techniques. Um, but what many of these methods had in common was that they were not as efficient, um, very slow, uh, and also beyond a certain point, um, they reached some saturation in terms of accuracy as well. Uh, but then came the big breakthrough. So. In 2012, when AlexNet first came out, um, it was a classification network that broke all records on the ImageNet visual uh, recognition challenge. Uh, that was when um, convolutional neural networks really started uh, showing their mettle in terms of um, computer vision tasks. So after that, a lot of research has occurred. Many paradigms have come up. These are just some of the ones. And yeah, we'll go into a little more detail uh, on some of these. So just a quick refresher on deep learning. Um, so you have your traditional neural networks. They have multiple uh, fully connected layers where each neuron is connected to every um, 
uh, neuron from the previous layers. And what you could do is use an image, consider it a vector of numbers and pass it through the network. But you can see, I mean, an image um, is different from a vector. So it's a 2D input and there's a lot of spatial information that you lose when you do this. So that's the reason uh, convolutional networks uh, really um, were helpful in this task because they encode that spatial information into the feature representations that are learned through the network. So a little bit about convolutions. So you have an image, it's a matrix of numbers. You have a kernel or a filter that's another matrix of numbers. And every kernel has a receptive field, so it looks at a certain region in the input, and it goes over that. And you, it's a dot product between two matrices, essentially and you have a response of the filter. So you would expect the filter to have a higher response when there is a certain pattern in the input in a certain place and a lower response in the area where that pattern is not found. So in that manner, we can consider filters as learning different features from the input image. And you can have multiple filters like this where each one of them is responsible for different feature. And usually what we do is stack these in several uh, layers. And this is like the building block of uh, CNN. And uh, you can see that uh, these, uh, as you go through the network, in terms of spatial dimensions, uh, it goes from higher resolution to lower resolution. When you look at the feature dimension, the number of channels, uh, that there is an increase in that. So you're learning uh, a lot of different features. And for example, this again, this is, um, of some of the feature, um, the, the filters from the AlexNet that I mentioned earlier. Um, so you know, this was from the very first layer, so they are very interpretable. So you can see some filters have learned to identify edges of different orientations, and others have um, recognized blobs of color. Um, as you go deeper into the network, they usually become less interpretable than this. So now, um, so a filter is uh, a matrix of numbers. So how do you choose these numbers? I mean, setting them by hand uh, defeats the purpose of these networks. What you want to do is set them based on the data, learn them from the data. So if you consider uh, the model to be a function that has several parameters, and you define loss to be the difference between the, um, the output of this model and the actual correct output, and if you try to visualize the loss in some dimensions, uh, this is something um, that you'll see. So if you start with a random set of parameters, you would end up on a random point on the curve. And your objective here is to minimize the loss. So minimize the difference between the output of your model and the actual uh, output uh, that you know to be correct. So this is done through a technique called gradient descent. Um, and the model sees data and it knows which direction to move on the curve uh, so as to minimize the loss. And this ha happens iteratively until it reaches a minima and hopefully that's our optimal um, solution. So just building up some intuition again for the object detection, I mentioned earlier that it is a combination of um, localization and classification. So just looking at the classification problem, uh, what you could do is take a data set like the one you see uh, of images that are very tightly cropped around the objects in them and train a simple classifier network on them. And in the next stage where you actually have a bigger input with several objects, you could take a sliding window, you can move it over different regions in the image and at each stage pass that patch to the network that you trained and ask it, yeah, what do you see? at this particular stage. You can use different sizes of windows, um, different strides for coarse grain, fine grained um, recognition. Uh, but I mean, at every stage, if you have to make a forward pass through the entire network, you can imagine that it's quite computationally expensive. Uh, but luckily, as we've seen before, the convolutions that we have, all of these are modeled as big matrix multiplications. So you don't do this sequentially, but in parallel, uh, the convolutional network takes care of this across the image. So 
when you think about how object detection models are built, um, so typically any convolutional network in the initial layers, um, it acts as a feature extractor, so it learns these rich representations of the image. Now, working with these, there is a class of models called two-stage detectors. So it very closely follows um, the idea that I described earlier of having these windows that you look for the object in. Uh, so in the first stage, the network looks at the feature maps and it tries to answer the questions, is there an object and where could the object be? So you have those red boxes that you see uh, on the feature map on the right. Uh, these are proposals that the network makes. Yeah, possibly there is an object here. And what the second stage of the network does is look at each of these different proposals and tries to classify what object could there be in that and also refines the location on it a, li uh, of it a little bit. So where exactly is the object and what is the object? But then later came another paradigm of models called the one-stage detectors in which this two-stage pipeline is not present anymore. And the detection head that's responsible for locating the boxes and classifying them directly works with the feature maps and not with any of these proposals that another intermediate layer has to make. So when one-stage detectors came, they really offered a very lightweight, a faster solution to this task of object detection. Um, it is worth mentioning that two-stage detectors are more accurate at localizing objects and even at classifying them. But um, if you have any limitations, say you want to run it in real time, your go-to would probably be a one-stage detector because it's just faster. These are some of the popular architectures under each kind. Um, we'll look at one of them called the YOLO. It's a one-stage detector in a little bit more detail. So YOLO V3. Um, V3 does indicate that it came third in the series of the YOLO family of models. And YOLO stands for you only look once, not you only live once. Um, and what that means is that you only pass the image once through the network and you end up with the boxes as well as um, the classification for each box. So the way this is done, like there's obviously a lot of implementation details, but I won't get into um, the complete detail of that. On a very high level, uh, it looks at the image as um, a grid. So there's several cells and each cell of the grid is responsible for detecting a fixed number of objects. So every um, cell always tells you that there's three possible objects, but of course there's a score associated with each of it, which it learns from the data that you can use to filter out. And uh, it looks at the entire image to make every detection and all of the classes are detected in parallel, but there's also an associated probability map that you use to get at the final detections. This is just a, a diagram of the network. Um, so YOLO has this great feature where the, the, the features that it learns are in a hierarchical manner. So if you can see for the uh, first stage, when, uh, when you look at the small objects that it detects, so it uses uh, feature maps that are quite downscale. So very small feature maps. But for the next scale of detections, the feature maps are upsampled but they're also combined with uh, higher level features learned from earlier layers, and both of those are used to uh, make detections at a medium scale. And similarly for larger objects as well. So you have these three different scales of detections associated. Yeah, so coming back to the three questions that we asked in the beginning. Um, so is there an object? The ob this is the output of the model, and the objectness score in the middle is the answer to that. Is there an object? Then where is the object? So you have the box coordinates. And what is the object? You have the class scores. So uh, the way YOLO is built again, uh, so I, I mentioned that every cell always predicts fixed number of objects, right? So there could be many uh, predictions for even the background areas where there is no object, uh, but the objectness score again takes care of that. You can just set a threshold there and say, just throw away everything below that and everything above that could be an object. Um, but there are cases where 
um, say if the object is very large or if it's present close to the boundary of uh, a grid cell, there could be multiple cells that predict the same object and both of them could be quite high in confidence. So uh, how do you actually get from that uh, very noisy output to the clean output? So before we get to that, I introduce one um, common um, metric that to be aware of in, um, uh, in the context of object detection. So in the images that I've shown here, um, if you consider green to be the ground truth box and red to be the prediction, um, which would you say is a better prediction? The one on the left or the one on the right or in the middle? The right? Yeah, yeah, that makes sense for us, right? So the detection quality increases from the left to the right. And just mathematically speaking, um, we have this metric called the IOU score, or the intersection over union. So it, it, it is a measure of the overlap between two boxes in terms of their intersection and union. And if you calculate those for the boxes shown, uh, you would see that the one on the right has the highest uh, IOU out of all of them. So typically what you could do is if you're trying to make a choice between these three boxes, you could say a threshold and say that, yeah, everything below, I don't know, say 0.8 is bad, about 0.9 is good. It, it depends, it depends on your application. And this is commonly used also in, um, to measure the quality of detections uh, later on when you're trying to associate the ground truth to the predictions across entire images. So coming back to the earlier problem um, of post-processing the output, um, if you have multiple high confidence detections around the same object and you want to understand how to get rid of them, uh, an application of the intersection over union uh, is that, so say you have three boxes here, what you could do is find the most confident out of all of them, then find the overlap of the other boxes the IOU score of the other boxes with respect to the most confident one. And again, threshold it, depends on your application. Um, say you choose 0.6 or something, everything above that, if there's an overlap, get rid of those. You just end up with the one box, um, the most confident box, and the, it's most likely to contain the object exactly in it. This is a technique called non-maximum suppression, and it's used to get rid of duplicate detections. Sorry? Um, it could be in some cases that um, there is there are many many objects quite close to each other, but also you can't really threshold it um, across the entire image because there could be smaller objects that are lower confident, right? But um, if you use a global score threshold of say 0.5, but smaller objects are predicted with 0.4. But there's a lot of small objects presented there, and you know that you don't want to get rid of all of them, but in the vicinity, you want the most confident one. So, yeah. Okay, so before we go on to the challenges again, are there any more questions um, about what we discussed? Okay, so YOLO for speed over accuracy. Um, again, sorry. Two, two stages detected are still not accurate, but they are more information intensive. Right? Yeah. So. yeah, they are considerably, uh, the two stage detectors are considerably more expensive. So it depends. I mean, if, if you want a system that's very accurate, but not necessarily running in real time, um, maybe you want to run some offline um, experiments, then you can still uh, use the two stage detectors. Um, and also, again, the YOLO that I mentioned, so YOLO V3 came out in 2018, so in, yeah, yeah, there, there have been many, there's been X, R, F, a uh, number of letters appended to YOLO. Um, so four years is a long time in this field, uh, and a lot of models have come out. The reason we chose to speak about YOLO V3 here is that at the time, um, it had a number of improvements that really offered this sensible trade-off between accuracy and uh, speed. So, and it's a relatively easy architecture to understand, so that's the reason we're using it here. But yeah, it depends on your application really what you choose in the end. 
Um, I would say that is a little tricky, small objects. Um, it does tend to miss it because when you look at a grid, um, every grid proposes, um, say, three objects, but then you only end up choosing one. But there could be multiple tiny objects within it, and that is a shortcoming of the YOLO. You could use a more granular grid, um, divide the image into many smaller parts, and uh, expect an improvement in the small object detection. Yeah. Um, anything else? Okay, um, if there's nothing else, a little bit about the challenges that we face here. So in terms of um, the data set itself, uh, we could just end up in a case with very few images. So you have too little data, then the model cannot reliably learn from it. Um, again, you could have very small objects, as was brought up, uh, which is always a challenge. Um, and it's, it's, it's always you experiment and you try to find out what works best. Um, or there could be occlusions in the data set where objects are not fully visible, but you're still trying to identify them. Or just plain old class imbalance where you have more examples, far more examples for a few classes and not as many for the others. Or there could be high intra-class variance, which means for, uh, say you have the class dog, but you have many different breeds of dog in that. So. Uh, it, just a lot of variance, and it, which is a difficult problem for the model. Or again, in terms of just how the data is collected, uh, or at what cameras you have access to, varying viewpoint, illumination, and uh, several other factors that you'll have to account for. So this is on the data side, and again on the model side. So if you're trying to develop a real-time system, it could be too big, too big, too slow to run, uh, and you'll have to take all of those into account. So especially on the data side. Um, so th the next thing that we're going to see, Vincenzo is going to talk you through it, is to see how, uh, even when you have little data, how do you actually choose the best um, data out of that so you can gain the most insights from it. Yeah, that's me, so thank you. And Vincenzo will be on now. Okay, sampling a diverse data set. Yes, as uh, Anusha said, um, uh, object detection models are great models uh, with uh, great performance, uh, but have some kind of issues. Most of those are related to the data. And so it is important, in particular in industrial setting, create a good data set. In particular in industrial setting, uh, differently from uh, the academia, we have uh, a lot of data. Uh, uh, think, for example, to uh, the cameras. They have uh, many frames, but most of those frames are, that are images, essentially, uh, are uh, almost identical, and so are almost useless. Uh, and uh, the second point is that uh, something that uh, to, uh, to take into account is that we need label uh, to annotate those images and annotating is quite expensive. So it is a, a fundamental task to identify what is an informative data set in order uh, to select the uh, correct uh, uh, images to annotate and then to train the model on that. Uh, yes, uh, in uh, this presentation, uh, um, so I'm talking about creating the most informative data set to try to identify what is informative. The problem is uh, uh, mostly related with, object, uh, is related with object detection, but in general to any machine learning model. And uh, as it is uh, related to, uh, to any machine learning model, uh, the idea uh, is uh, to utilize a very simple example, uh, just uh, to have a picture in, in our mind and uh, impossible to generalize the principle that I'm utilizing here uh, to different other contexts. So let's uh, consider just a function uh, and that goes uh, from uh, R to R, just the single dimensional line. 
if you want to think uh, from an image perspective, uh, think of the x-axis like uh, the image features and the y-axis, uh, the semantic uh, uh, properties of that uh, of those images. Uh, for example, if we are in an object detection setting, there are only two classes. Uh, uh, the y-axis could be uh, the difference between uh, uh, objects in one class of one classes minus objects of the other classes. Uh, positive means that there are more objects from the class A, and negative means that there are less classes of object B. And what we should avoid is to sample an uninformative uh, uh, data set, like the one on the right. As we see, uh, if we sample only the some particular points, the one in the interval of minus five five, uh, we obtain something uh, that is not uh, quite informative because in that case, the, the uh, inferred function would be just a straight line that is not the real one. Uh, yeah, one thing that I didn't mention, obviously the constraint is uh, that we can sample only a small amount of data point. We can evaluate this function in a small data point. The evaluation is uh, the, equivalent, uh, the equivalent function of annotating the images. Okay, uh, in order to avoid that, uh, that we sample only in a small uh, interval, standard approach is uh, saying, okay, I have all my videos, and uh, I simply, uh, uh, I will sample randomly uh, the frames from the video. But uh, that, that works only under the assumption the data is uniformly distributed in my videos. That is not the case. And in general, in most of our life, we see that most of the data are almost identical. So sampling uniformly the image we will have a situation like that, where essentially we have again a straight line plus an outlier. This, this will be considered an outlier if we consider only those 20 data points, so it's not useful. But we can see from this example that all the points are uh, concentrated around the uh, values minus, five, minus five, uh, 5 in the x-axis and are very close, uh, the distance is uh, less than 0 0.5. So one idea could be just, okay, I remove the close data points. Is that possible? Yes, it is. And uh, one way is uh, uh, utilizing the hashing map. Uh, those particular hashing uh, map is uh, just a function that goes from the image space to a string space, uh, a binary string space. And this, uh, the idea is uh, the opposite of the standard hashing map, where we want to find a single signature for an image that uh, is different from any particular image, uh, but actually here is a signature of a kind of similar images. In order to do that, we have first to uh, remove the noise in the image, rescale those in order to, have, uh, to uh, consider only the aggregate information, and then binarize and convert to the flat function. Now uh, I will show that. Good question. Uh, the question is uh, how to remove the noise. Uh, I will utilize a notebook. Uh, yes, here you have uh, the image, the same in the data set that of this kind of this player, Simone Pepe. And um, we convert to tensor because essentially Everything will be done uh, with PyTorch. And first, way, uh, first uh, idea is uh, to remove uh, uh, the colors. So uh, our image is just a matrix, uh, a set of metrics with the three different channels, uh, the red, green, and blue. And the idea is to uh, map everything into a single channel. Uh, for the sake of this uh, talk, everything will be done uh, via convolutional uh, layers, that is a uh, convolution map, that uh, are the ones that Anusha previously explained. Essentially, most of the thing in computer vision can be described in terms of uh, uh, convolutional maps. And uh, in this way, we have to define a special convolutional map uh, that uh, 
uh, is just uh, a matrix uh, one uh, times one with a uh, uh, width of three. Essentially, the idea is to map each pixel with the three channels into a single one. Uh, here we have uh, some parameters that are the kernel size, as I said, the length of this matrix, the stride, how much I have to move, uh, because uh, as Anusha showed, uh, the, uh, uh, um, a kernel uh, mapping is just a function that moves from the top uh, left of the uh, images to the top right. And uh, the stride is how much I move. And, uh, and the padding is not relevant, it's how much I add on the border of the image. Uh, yes, and this is a way to uh, reduce the information because, I repeat, I want uh, to uh, get the global information uh, of the image itself. Another uh, way to remove the noise is to apply Gaussian filter. What is noise? Noise is a particular information that is only on a single pixel. So Gaussian uh, blurring is uh, doing exactly the opposite, is associating to each pixel the information of the pixel around. So in this way, we remove noise that, uh, because all the pixels uh, around the noisy pixel will have the same information. And all the pixel, we are sure that all the pixels will share common information. This is a, a way to remove the noise. It's not the only one, uh, but in general, is to apply those kind of kernels in order to share the information. Uh, in the Gaussian kernel, uh, uh, the idea is that the point in the center uh, should have the highest value. That means I have to get uh, the most information from the, real, uh, the actual pixel and a slightly less information from the uh, pixels aside. Uh, the standard deviation defines how much information from I want uh, from the far pixels, if I select uh, a very small standard deviation, means that I will have a, uh, 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 no information, so it would be just the identity matrix. Uh, matrix. And uh, instead, if I select infinity, or, yeah, for example, it's larger, I will have a uniform. Essentially, would be the mean. Uh, this is the case, for example, that is uh, infinity. And so here we have an, uh, a metric, uh, an image where I remove the possible uh, added noise. A second approach is rescaling. As I said, I want global information. So I don't want an information from a pixel perspective, but aggregate those pixels. How to do that? Again, with a, a convolution neural network. And the difference here is that I like a kernel a bigger kernel because I want to extract more information from different pixels and a stride uh, larger. In, in particular, in this case, kernel and, and uh, stride have the same dimension. That means that uh, each new pixel uh, will be obtained from different pixels. Essentially, there will be no intersection when uh, the two metrics will slide. And so we obtain a smaller uh, image. To be honest, that is done also for computational reasons uh, in order to compute the hashing map and then binarize just. Uh, okay, uh, if there are no questions, if, uh, yes, please. Definitely, yes, the idea is just for the purpose yeah, of the. Yeah, it's not a convolutional network. Uh, they are not learned. Uh, those convolutional layers uh, are, uh, it is just to, to, uh, to show that you can utilize uh, all the processing in machine learning can be done via convolutional uh, layer. That means that in principle, a deep neural network can learn also these ones. Are not something that, uh, it's something that you can learn also. So in principle, uh, a deep neural network if needed can learn that. And uh, it was done also uh, to try to explain very quickly how convolution works. Uh, any other question? Okay. 
Okay, that means that uh, I have an image of Simon and Pepe and a corrupted image of the same player and uh, where I just added noise. And we see that uh, uh, the Ashima is exactly the same. That uh, ex uh, we say that it's uh, the same and when it is the same means that I'm in distance. That means the difference in the string space is zero. Instead, a completely different image, the pizza one, will have a, a larger distance. So uh, we can say that pizza uh, is different from the uh, player image and uh, obviously a corrupted image. In this way, we learn a way to have a more diverse data set because we learn a, a, a local metric distance. Essentially, we are able to identify what close means. Uh, um, yes, and uh, this is uh, uh, the same setting as before where uh, with the cross are defined the points that are considered close to other ones. Is that enough? Obviously no, because uh, as we see here, there are two points that are far uh, different from the uh, stand, uh, straight line, uh, but only two points are identified as close. That means that if I resample the data, don't considering the very close points, I have for sure a better function, but it's still difficult to identify uh, the real function that we've seen in the first slide. So uh, it's, it's still incomplete, but we learned one important thing, that is uh, that a concept of distance is, fun uh, is uh, fundamental. And uh, if we uh, would be able to define a global definition, uh, of this and not just a local like the Ashim map would be perfect. In particular because defining a metric in uh, my uh, image uh, space means also that we can sample equidistant data. So equidistant data uh, uh, are data that describe completely the function or if I have some kind of extra function, for example, I don't want to have uh, points with the Y value uh, lower than a certain quantity. For, or for example, I know that in certain area uh, there are uh, images of classes in which uh, I'm not interested in. I can remove that and sample more on the classes where, uh, uh, that are more relevant for my task. So we see that the concept of learning a metric in my latent space or in my image space is fundamental to learn an informative data set. Okay, uh, is it possible to learn a metric? Yes, it's possible, at least according to the uh, deep learning theory. Indeed, according uh, to uh, uh, the, uh, the standard assumption in deep learning, deep learning are working because they are learning a hidden uh, representation of the data. Uh, that uh, is, uh, that uh, lie into a manifold. A manifold is just a surface or a line in, 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 dimension, in many dimensions. And in there, it's possible to identify some kind of similarities. For example, in this uh, image, uh, 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 we see uh, um, uh, a representation of the books and and we see that similar books are clustered together. Obviously, uh, it is to mention that the kind of metric that we, the network learned is learned in unsupervised way. We don't say what is close. The network is learning what, uh, a, a peculiar metric. So different networks are learning different metrics. For example, if I utilize a self-supervised uh, a network to learn the features, I will have a task agnostic uh, representation. Vice versa, if I utilize a supervised uh, model, I will learn uh, a task specific representation. So a metric that is useful for that particular task. Indeed, the concept of informative 
is a task related informative. Something could be informative uh, for a specific task, but not informative for another one, and vice versa. So, uh, according um, to that point, and uh, uh, remembering that our goal is to find an informative data set for object detection, uh, the idea here is to utilize a pre-trained model on a standard uh, uh, data set, for example, COCO, that is publicly available, and uh, utilize the, that, kind of data, uh, that kind of model to learn a representation uh, for our uh, particular task. In particular, we utilize the same model, this backbone that is only the feature extractor, uh, uh, that uh, is called Darknet, that is the one utilized in YOLO, and as already Anusha explained, uh, is, uh, uh, yeah, it is extracting three different kind of features. One thing uh, to mention uh, before I move uh, into the notebook is that I said it is a manifold, the latent space. When the latent space is particularly large, uh, for in this case we have at least 500 features, a common assumption is that uh, the data is, the, is distributed around an hypersphere, just a sphere in larger dimension. And, uh, uh, in, uh, and as we are interested on the difference between the features, uh, the idea is uh, uh, to project the points into the closest sphere and compute the Euclidean distance. This is called cosine distance and because uh, you can think also like just compute the cosine uh, between the two points with respect to the origin. Uh, yeah, uh, so that I think it's time to move uh, to the notebook. Yeah, we have a model and uh, obviously as I said, uh, model is uh, a general uh, object vector model. This in particular is uh, a YOLO um, uh, model. Uh, uh, and we are interested only on the back one. And, uh, and we want to extract the information from the image, the same image as above. And uh, uh, as expected, we obtain three different ones. We see that uh, those, uh, the last two numbers are the dimension of the uh, uh, Latin image, let's say in this way. And those are the channels. In the standard image space, those are the dimension of the image, and those are only three, the RGB. Here are more because uh, those are semantic information. Uh, larger are the um, uh, deeper we go, more are the kind of features. And uh, smaller is the, this kind of latent image. In particular, we will focus only on the third and last feature. Uh, that's, as we see, uh, is 512 uh, features. Uh, here, the idea is exactly the opposite of what we did uh, for the hashing map. In the hashing map, we want to remove the, inform, uh, the image specific information. So we did an average on the channel. Here I said we want to extract the information about the features that are something close to the semantic information of the image itself. So the idea is to do uh, an average uh, in uh, uh, yeah, uh, yeah, sorry, uh, an average in the in the image space, and that, as I said, could be uh, described also as a convolutional. Uh, this kind of uh, particular average kernel <coughs> is just uh, an average uh, uh, pooling average. Uh, essentially, I move from. Uh, uh, a tensor that had uh, uh, 512 uh, 
2022 uh, to uh, 512.11. So it's just a vector of features. There are more, no more uh, uh, special information stored, or at least not directly, not uh, explicitly. Um, the, and uh, this is uh, the idea. So in, uh, if uh, in the hashing map I did the, I tried to uh, do an average in the channel, here I do an average in the uh, space. Uh, yes, and uh, uh, that uh, could help to identify, uh, uh, sorry, this kind of 512 features are the uh, description of uh, our data point. This kind of description uh, could allow us to define some kind of metric. This is similar to the, uh, what we've seen with the, uh, with the books. And we see that similar images, for example, uh, images of, uh, with a person are close together. Images with pizza are close together. Giraffe images are uh, different from each other. And uh, yes, uh, and uh, more or less, it's possible to identify some kind of similarities. We have said obviously that those kind of differences are not maybe uh, if uh, we do manually, we should uh, select a different kind of weights. Those are learned by the model, and we don't know for which reason the tennis player is so close to a pizza. Evidently, for the model, they are related. Uh, uh, and uh, this uh, can be seen also in, uh, in this larger picture, where uh, there are uh, all the distances. And we see that essentially, uh, here at zero is when the difference is uh, less than 0 0.3. And we see that uh, essentially those are the giraffe images, those are the pizza images, and uh, those are the, all the players' images. And uh, more or less, it's possible to identify the squares, and if there, are, if there are no black, anyway, the difference is close to 0 0.3. So they belong. Uh, it's possible to identify some kind of cluster. Something strange is that for many pizzas image, there are no black points. Okay, there is only one with uh, uh, themselves. Why that? Let's have a look to many images, many pizzas, because there are pizzas and uh, people. So it doesn't belong in the pizzas cluster and neither in uh, the people class. Is something separate. It's something in the middle. Uh, so the metric somehow is working. Obviously, this is a, uh, only a small uh, sample of images, but I hope that uh, uh, the idea uh, works. Uh, okay, just uh, uh, concluding. And uh, I do a summary. Uh, we, have some, uh, we have served that informative is uh, an, a task information, but can be defined as a diverse. The, uh, if uh, I have a diverse data set, this is more useful because I'm storing more information. This is uh, something uh, related to the more general idea of entropy. And uh, sampling uniformly is not enough, in particular in real cases, because our uh, data originally is not uniformly distributed. And uh, in order to have a good data set, we, uh, we need uh, to apply two different stages. First of all, remove the almost identical data points. That is done uh, by the shim maps. Identify clusters, uh, as we've seen, learning the latent manifold. Uh, via deep neural network. And uh, let me stress that the two points are necessary uh, because um, we say that the clustering is important for uh, learning, uh, the uh, mapping into latent space is important to learn the distance, but we've seen that are two kind of different distances. 
and the clustering images is not perfect when we uh, 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 to deal with the noisy images or very similar images. Indeed, if we consider again uh, the images of this football player, we see that the, for the hashing distance, they are essentially the same. But for the cosine distance, the distance is 0 0.32, essentially, uh, according to the distance in the latent space, the other one is just another image of the same class. That uh, uh, is not something that we want. So the two steps are fundamental, and uh, the order should be first, the hashing, and second, learning the cluster. Once we learn the cluster, we can sample uniformly within each data set, each cluster. And uh, if we know, inform, uh, we have some kind of information, for example, that some kind of cluster is associated to some uh, semantic uh, property that in which we are not interested in, we can discard this kind of cluster, or at least sample only really a few of those. Okay, uh, say so that we have seen how to uh, what is an object detector, how to create a data set. So the next step is really um, to learn, uh, train an object detector with this uh, data set. And so it's time for transfer learning. Over to you, Paul. All right, thanks for that. So. Now we'll all ask experts on how like the theory of object detection and CNNs work, and we know how to get a you know efficiently sample a data set. We're gonna basically get stuck in and do some object detection um, and see the kind of role of transfer learning in computer vision and how it's important in um, object detection models. So, as I said, we we want to do some object detection. And we've chosen Yolo V3 because we want to do some like real time object detection. And we know about uh, how to like, efficiently sample some data because annotation is expensive, so we can't just be there, you know, 24/7 um, labeling, annotating images. So you've got some data you want to annotate. You either do it yourself, you pay for it, or you make your intern do it. Um, and then now you actually want to train your model. So we have a little data set. Um, uh, this is like a, subsam a subset of the arthropod taxonomy data set, which is just an open source one on Kaggle, um, if you want to find it. And this is just yeah, a, a subsample of that, where it's got um, seven classes of, I, th I think it's the order of the insect. Um, I'm not an entomologist, so I can't remember. Um, so uh, yeah, we've got a small data set, a couple of hundred examples of each, um, each object class, um, which is as kind of computer vision, like modern computer vision goes, that's a pretty small data set. So if you compare that to um, the like Microsoft Cocoa data set, that has got um, 330,000 images with 200,000 of them labeled, millions of objects, 80 object categories, and it's got, you know, bounding box annotations. It's got like, um, you can kind of see it around here, kind of like the pixel segmentation of um, certain objects. It's also got like, uh, you know, human key points and face key points, and kind of loads of stuff like that. Um, and so, like, the Cocoa data set is also important because it's kind of the, it gives a lot of, like, standardized tools for object detection. So, kind of, any open source um, object detection framework will use probably the Cocoa kind of format for annotations and things, as well as um, it provides the, uh, like, API for kind of visualizing images um, with annotations and also your API for uh, getting your kind of, uh, your performance metrics, um, which you mostly use. So before we go, a quick word on the performance metrics. Some of my pictures are missing. But yeah, cool. So I talked about IOU earlier. And so in object detection, you're using kind of average precision. is the kind of most common, um, Kind of performance metric for comparing models, which you'll see in you know if you look at papers doing that, and basically the way it works is, you know when you have an image, you have multiple objects maybe, so you need to match detections with the ground truth objects, 
and do that based on like the um, IOU score. So you basically, there's like some common metric tests. You've got um, average precision 50, so that's with a, you know, matches done based on a, you know, when they have an IOU greater than 0 0.5, that's considered a match. And then, you know, you can assign true positives, false positives, and all that in that way. And then you get have a pre precision recall curve for that. And then your average precision is uh, your area under that curve, which is kind of um, interpolated in, computer in this um, API. So yeah, the um, three we'll look at is average precision with this IOU of 0.5, also one when it's over 0.75, and then the Cocoa version, which is uh, you take average precision at multiple different IOUs, so you kind of end up with like average average precision. Um, and then also averaged over classes, so it's um, it's kind of a, a little bit convoluted, but it's kind of the usual way of doing it. But we'll just focus on the more simple ones for now. Um, so, if you have your data set and you want to train a model to do object detection, the classic thing is if you have one task in one domain, so say like you have a big data set like Coco, you just train that model on that, and then you test it on whatever you know, day you're using test it or deploy it, then, you know, you finish that project, you move on, and next week you're doing your insects. So you, uh, you just train a separate model on that and deploy it on your insect pictures, and then they're just, they're separate. So if you do that with object detection, then <coughs> you download some source code for Yolo v3, and then you have all randomly initialized weights, and you, you just, you train on data set, so you see what happens. And you think, oh yeah, the training loss looks okay up here. It looks like it's converging to something sensible. But then your validation and like test average precision looks pretty questionable. Um, it's not doing great. And you could do things like, you know, you could train this for a bit longer. You could do like high parameter optimizations and data augmentation and all that stuff. But you know, you find it's still not working great. So there's a kind of transfer learning approach is from your big task of Coco, you transfer some knowledge from that first model into your second. And so in computer vision, that's kind of uh, the way it works is you use these pre-trained weights. So you know, training these like giant CNNs, you need like tons of processing power, tons of data, and just tons of time. But a lot of the um, like actual features themselves um, are actually kind of generic. So in the early layers, as I kind of mentioned earlier, these are low-level features where it starts with like edges, blobs, and things like that, which are kind of just generic um, image features. And then that kind of slowly builds up till you know the late layers where you have more semi-semantic parts potentially, um, which you know that they'll be a bit more task-specific. But so what the kind of standard approach is is you have these pre-trained weights from usually ImageNet or maybe you know another big data set of your choosing. And then you either just use the feature extractor um, with those weights and just keep them as they are. So just using it as, as if it was like, you know, a really good handcrafted feature. Uh, or you fine tune the model using just those weights as initialization and then um, continue your gradient descent from there. So if you look at our YOLO model, so you have the basic part is this, uh, the, the backbone, which is the dark net mentioned earlier. And then you have these three, um, oh, these three uh, dete like detection heads, which do your um, object classification and bounding box regression to actually turn you know, a feature map of the image into you know, here's the boxes where an object is, and this is what the object is. So the kind of the classic thing in a computer vision is you use, you know, um, image net pre-trained weights in your backbone. So in this case, you have your dark net, and you load in um, image net pre-trained weights at the start, and then continue it. And so compared to before, you end up with, you know, your loss curves has improved kind of quite noticeably, and so has your um, like average precision on your validation set. So, you know, that looks a lot better. But you can go a bit further, because they're obviously detection on cocoa and detection of insects are somewhat related. So your output of a detection model is 
basically some bounding box coordinates, um, usually an objectness score and then some class scores. But if you're detecting people and chairs and whatever else on Coco or insects in this data set, then you're still kind of proposing a bounding box and some objectness in the same way. It's only really the number of classes you have and what those semantic classes actually are that change. So you can actually transfer not just the backbone, but essentially every layer from the head except the very last one where you need to change the size of it. So, you know, you can get that, not just the image features from your pre-trained network, but also some of the, the knowledge about how to propose a kind of generic bounding box for some arbitrary object type of thing. So, trading on that, then this is a, now in green. Again, you see it's, it's, it's in, the, the tra training curve is improving. You're getting slightly more average precision with 0.5. Um, and another thing is you're just getting to, you're getting to kind of a, you know, you could get away with training these for less time. Like they're, they're getting to, you know, a stable point in with that learning rate kind of more quickly. So you could cut down that training time and that would be very helpful when you're actually doing your parameter optimization, like hyperparameter optimization or your data augmentation kind of tuning. Um, so that's going to be, with this like um, AP50, as we mentioned earlier, it's kind of like uh, an IOU of 0 0.5 is actually like, that's not that good of an overlap. That's kind of like, that's a measure of is the model getting vaguely the right object in the right place. But if you look at more kind of the other, um, the other IOU, uh, av the other, average precisions with other IOUs, there we go, um, then, you know, with 0.75, that's all up to much more accurate bounding box, and then, as the cocoa one, yeah, that goes all the way up to, like, a 0.95 IOU, so, like, super accurate. And that's where you're seeing a much bigger difference between using just ImageNet pre-trained weights or using the cocoa ones. So you're just getting that, you know, you're, you're transferring that knowledge of image features, but also being able to transfer this more like refined um, bounding box regression for, for objects, as well as benefits like you don't have to train as long and things like that. Um, so we end up with, can you see the bounding box very well? Not really. Um, just some examples, if you like, looking at insects. Um, so yeah, generally, if you look at this kind of training from scratch, which is kind of just jargon for using random initialization in your weights, um, it's getting some bounding boxes, but it's kind of, you know, getting quite a few. It doesn't quite know the difference. Um, and again, the, uh, you know, it's, it's kind of quite a subtle difference between the image and Coco, where, you know, the, the empirical <coughs> results are quite close. Um, it's going to be a more like, you know, you just end up with a slightly, you know, slightly better um, bounding box that kind of fits the ground truth a bit better. And maybe there's somewhere it's kind of missing stuff and things like that. Um, and so I have a qu quick notebook, which is basically um, just, you know, if you wanted to quick and dirty, just train a model to your detection. So this is just some data set, but like the process one I have where it's got, you know, your object label and then the image it's in and then it's kind of bounding box coordinates in the image, and then also the image height and image width. And so, you have to this graph of just the, you know, the train test split and representation of each class, and you, know, you can do all your classic EDA you love to do because you're you know, diligent data scientists. And then, you know, one of the very important things that I said is kind of the Coco annotation format, because basically, whether you use like, you know, any open source detection framework, like you know, if you use Torch Vision or if you use um, Detectron or MM detection or like any of them, then they'll pretty much all use this by default or at least have um, have it kind of as part of how they read annotations. So it's basically you, you save um, each of your split in, into like a JSON file and you just have a, you know, uh, which is a dictionary and then you have your list of images, your list of, list of object categories, and then your list of annotations. And so you're, again, your list of images is just a list of, like a list of more dictionaries. 
Um, but it's kind of uh, the important things, I think, is you can find all the stuff on the Coco um, website for more detail. Um, but there's a lot of things, a lot of like quirks to it. Like when you're giving the image ID, then you need to do it as the ID index from one. If you have it in zero, it'll break the um, performance metrics and stuff like that. There's a lot of quirks like this that aren't documented. Um, and the same with um, uh, image ID, like when you go into annotations, you have ID, but that's the annotation and a lot of this kind of stuff. But anyway, so you, you take your um, you take your process data where you have all your examples, which image it's in, all the banner is, and you can write this um, into uh, the cooker style JSON file, um, which is just that's just an example of um, uh, me doing this for this, and you can use the kind of Cocoa API to like visualize some examples, just to you know do a sanity check to make sure you've written your bounding boxes correctly, and you're not just going to be training an object detector on on garbage. Um, another fun quirk of the Cocoa API is, for some reason, it doesn't put object like class labels on there, so go do that yourself. Um, but then you can actually kind of use an object detection um, framework to actually train a model. So this is for using M MM detection, which is um, just an open source model, which is kind of quite, it has kind of lots of validated, um, up-to-date architectures, so you can kind of do a quick check on what performs well, you can try a, diff a few different ones, and it has them all like implemented and validated, so you have you know their full standard kind of uh, optimizer settings and their data augmentation and things like that. So you end up, this is like you, you write a, a uh, .py file, which is your config for it, where you, you know, inherit from uh, some base model, in this case, kind of the standard YOLO v3 um, with a particular, like, backbone and particular parameters. And then you need to make some changes for your data set. So the first thing is you change, in your bounding box, you want to set how many classes you have. So in our case, we have seven insects, so I change it to seven. And then we add our data in, in, um, in this Coco dataset format, there are a few other formats as well, uh, and you can set up, you know, your your train test and validation sets, and as well as setting stuff like uh, how many, like your batch size on each GPU, um, whether you're doing it on one GPU or many, and you can also set your like number of workers for your pre-processing and augmentation and stuff, and then, so if you wanted to train from random weights then you actually have to explicitly set that in the uh, config to, uh, to to not load in pre-trained weights, which, because as I said, kind of using pre-trained weights is so, like, it's kind of done everywhere in computer vision at this point. Um, and another thing you can do is if you want to load fully from Cocoa models, then you can just add in a, another line to load some actual, like, uh, YOLO, YOLO v3 weights. So you're, this is only in your backbone where you'll be loading weights for just that part. Um, so then you can, again, you can do stuff like you can uh, use, they have functions like browsing the data set, which lets you, um, there were some pictures somewhere. All right, that's not working. Well, you could browse your data set and just see that, you know, your augmented training images, again, you know, you've not messed up your, your annotations there, and that all makes sense. And then, yeah, you can, um, you can just, like, run the model. And in this kind of, with this kind of, like, simple config file, you're not changing the optimizer kind of parameters or augmentation or anything, but that is something you can, it's kind of easily doable. Um, and then, yeah, once you've trained, you get to look what I've seen before, where you have your, um, you can you know, check, it, check your average position and your loss and everything, make sure everything looks great, and then compare your models, and yeah, again, just look at some lovely examples of insects. So, yeah, there's a few more examples here, where some, I can barely see the annotation, sir. Well, yes, I guess here's a good example where, uh, the cocoa one's managing to detect two insects, so there are others aren't detecting. Well, this is like thresholded off low, lower, uh, low, low scoring ones, as well as when you have like 
non-maximal suppression and you get over kind of like heavily over overlapping bounding boxes and things like that. Um, uh, yeah, that's it. That's us. So, thank you. <laughs> also, uh, Tesco is hiring. So if you're interested in data science, computer vision as well, then come talk to us. Any questions? They will be, yeah. I will fix that one that wasn't working. <laughs> Uh, how would we use detecting insects in particular, or? No, no, what, what is a more typical use case of object detection in Tesco? Uh, we'll see, like Tesco, if you go into a Tesco store, there's cameras everywhere. So kind of, there's dozens of use cases. A hashing question? <laughs> yes. Uh, so uh, there are many hashing uh, techniques. Uh, if I understood well, the question is uh, what, uh, how to choose the best one? No, I was wondering whether you could experiment with the locality sensitive hashing as a way of fast, very quickly being able to compute the approximation of the closest hashing value of the find so Oh, yes. Uh, in principle, uh, uh, the idea, uh, what you suggest, uh, so I think that uh, a cool uh, approach could be just uh, re to run first the clustering and then on the clustering uh, do uh, a gnashing uh, in order to restrict uh, uh, the data set, uh, the, the sample. Uh, yeah. Uh, but what I show uh, here was just uh, uh, for the uh, sake of the presentation. Obviously, when we compute the hashing and uh, uh, it's done uh, via standard libraries um, that uh, uh, do in a more smart way that just uh, then simply uh, uh, comparing uh, all, the, all the, as I did. Uh, I hope that I answered the question. But yeah, for sure, uh, applying clustering and uh, on the clustering, identify the similar uh, could be a good approach. Any other question? Yes, please. Oh, yes. Uh, what kind of application? We are a very new group in Tesco. So uh, those are just uh, experimentation. We want to understand uh, what we can do, what, uh, how good it could be uh, 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 object detection or object classification. Uh, if uh, we are able to identify some uh, uh, those kind of stuff. So first of all, we try with this uh, simple setting like the Coco, the Elvis, uh, or uh, any kind of synthetic data set, but there uh, could be many different possible applications. For example, identify if uh, a shelf is empty or identify how many products uh, there are uh, in a basket uh, or something like that. Uh, uh, yes, they use computer vision, but we are not in that group, so we don't know much. Uh. Oh, sorry. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, the notebooks will be, well, where will they be put? Um, uh, I don't know if by today, but by the end of the week, they will be online. Any other? 
you raise your hand? <laughs> okay. Cool. Uh, thanks for your time. Yeah, thanks everyone.